Welcome to the On a Mission Mojo podcast, where I have the pleasure of interviewing impact-driven founders, entrepreneurs, authors, and business experts who are actively working to create a positive difference in our world. I'm your host, Lori Young, a branding specialist, certified master marketer, and a passionate advocate for brands that possess heart, soul, and an unwavering commitment to drive change for humanity. It takes grit, a visionary mindset, and an abundance of mojo to navigate this journey. And the stories I share will undoubtedly ignite your passion. If you're seeking an infusion of inspiration, motivation, and valuable insights to amplify your impact, let's dive right in. Welcome to episode 15 of On a Mission Mojo podcast. I am super, super excited for our guest today. Uh, We met through a mutual Facebook group and have kind of already started our conversation. And one of the things that we have in common, but he's got me beat by a long shot, is that we have both uh, done the fire walk. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that, but actually our guest holds the record in the longest fire walk. So I'm so excited to introduce to you Kirik Ashley. He is a number one international best-selling author and success coach. Around the world, he's known as the Transformer. And I'm hoping he was gifted me with his book, um, How Would Love Respond? And I'm hoping that we have an opportunity to dive a little bit into that. But why don't we just stop, start with maybe, uh, Kirik, you just sharing a little bit about what you feel your mission is in the world. Oh, great being on your show, Lori. Um, my mission is very clear. It's to create global abundance through love and empowerment. Okay. Um, you know, I uh, work with sports teams around the world. I work with corporations, people, you know, but the funny part about it is I'm always really working with people, you know, mm-hmm. so no matter where I go, you know, because I was in Kuwait, people felt like uh, all my content came right out of the Quran. And I said, mm. well, I never read the Quran, but it's, it's, so it's really universal. You know, if we're not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. And so True. I, you know, I've, I've been very driven. Uh, I have uh, youth programs that we're doing, all kinds of things. And it's just to, to give people the strategy. See, because my job is not to teach content, it's to facilitate real lasting change. Mm. And because mm-hmm. of that, you know, um, I, I'm not really caring about what tool I use as sure. long as we get the result. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I know um, just a little bit about your story from just reading little things uh, about you. Like, I am sure that there was a catalyst um, that brought you to where you are today and brought you to do the work that you do. Why don't you share with us just a little bit about your story? Sure. I used to be an actor in Hollywood. I did uh, 38 motion pictures. I've also done... uh, over 500 movies behind the camera as a key and dolly grip and uh, was the assistant to a director who was also my Mr. Miyagi, you know, uh, his name's John Hersfeld and John is Sylvester Stallone's best friend. They were roommates in college. So okay. So I, I got to be friends with Sly for the last, well, since <laughs> I was 18 years old. That's and, fun. Um, John, uh, you know, he forced me to read Think and Grow Rich in 1980 I mean, forced me like he would call me up every day from his office at the studios. What page are you on? And he'd yell <laughs> if, I, if I wasn't doing my 20 pages a day. Right. Um, but then in 1989, I, I just finished a movie called Lock Up with Sylvester Stallone. OK, I'm on my way to, to do a Delta Force to a Chuck Norris. So being 27 years old, being a guy, you know, working with two action hero icons, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. one sequence, you're on top of the world. And right. when I showed up to the Philippines to do Delta Force, um, some of my best friends were on the show, you know, which they didn't even know I was coming. So Mike Graham, my best friend, who was a key grip that I worked with behind the camera when I was back in the States, uh, Don Marshall, the lighting director, Jeff Brewer, one of the stunt guys, you know, and then mm-hmm. we were filming, uh, doing some hairy stunts in the helicopter all day long. And then we had one small little pickup shot to do where we had okay. about 15 feet and shoot two lines of dialogue. And then uh, I'm sitting in a chopper with the machine gun between my legs and Mike's in there, camera's in there. And we ha- hover about two feet and the chopper 
the cameraman shifts the camera where I realize I'm not being photographed anymore. And I ask him, he goes, no, you can step out if you want. There, there was no real reason for me to step out besides make room for everybody else because I would have made 400 extra dollars for just staying on, you know, as part mm-hmm. of my pay package, you know. But I decided I'll make room. Another, another door gunner stepped out, chopper went up, and then went over the edge of a mountain and had a mechanical malfunction. And we had a helicopter crash and five of my friends died. Mike oh was my on gosh. fire when I pulled him out of the wreck and he uh, died in my arms on the way to the hospital. He was 29 years old. Wow. So for the next two and a half years, I had a, a gun in my mouth every night, a 357 Smith & Wesson pistol. I had five and a half grams of cocaine in my nose every night. I was drinking booze and smoking cigarettes. And mm. um, I wasn't partying. I was just trying to kill myself. Obviously, sure. Yeah. Thank God I'm not a success at everything in life. And so <laughs> um, once... Once I, I woke up one morning, I woke up and I realized that your life, your life is not really your own. Mm-hmm. You know, there's people who love you and care about you and you're dragging them down with you. And so I right. unscrewed a broom pole out of a broom and I mm-hmm. held it over my head like a samurai warrior. And I cut a line in the sand in my backyard in California. And I said, once I step over this line, I'm, I'm done. So right. I stepped over the line. I gave up cocaine. I gave up cigarettes. I gave up alcohol abuse. I gave all my guns away. Not, not to just people wandering down the street. I gave them away to gun collector friends of mine, and it was a pivotal moment. And my life is a byproduct of that that decision, that moment. Wow. So I know I there was a there was a time um, in your life where you I think this was mentioned maybe in your book or somewhere where you said that you were homeless in two places at one time. <laughs> yes. Yes, the company that brought <laughs> it's funny. The company that brought me to Australia uh-huh. um, uh, you know, lied to me and said that they sold children's educational products. What they actually sold was encyclopedias door to door. Oh gosh. Nineteen ninety seven. So you can imagine, you know, the internet's just coming in. Now right. uh, Sydney and some of the big cities here had the internet, but the regional areas didn't yet. So it was like mm-hmm. this thing, you know, but still it's nineteen ninety seven. Nobody really wants a you know, a full section of encyclopedias in her house anymore. It's not the fifth. Right. That was kind of gone in the days of world book and uh, yeah. Britannica, right? Was that the name of it? Britannica? <laughs> yeah. So this was Collier. So it was Collier. Okay. And so I took the company and made them successful again, but then they left me homeless living in a sheep shear shed down in a country town in New South Wales, which is a state here in Australia. Mm-hmm. So, I was homeless in two countries at the same time because I couldn't even fly back to the States to be homeless. Wow. Because I went through, they never paid me and they left me stranded here. And I went through all my savings to try to stay alive. And Mm -hmm. so that's when I decided that, um, well, let's make it back to Brisbane where I knew a few people because that's where I started my journey here. Mm -hmm. I had already done some, a bunch of speaking engagements and media when I was here because it's just kind of what I do. Sure. And so I um, had a guy's card that saw me speak like eight months earlier and said, if you ever want to produce one of your events, I'd love to do it. Uh, Mm -hmm. He had never done it before. He just was fascinated. Right. And so I called the guy up and we decided to do an event just so I could make money to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And um, I started doing free events to, to promote the paid event. And at one of those free events, I said, who here remembers the person who stood on the third box at the Olympics? Anybody rush out to buy your book thinking, oh, gee, how'd you get third? And a girl stands up and she said, I was on the third box at the Olympics. Oh, and I gosh. Said, okay. Ma'am, I wasn't picking on you. I didn't even know. I don't even know who you are. She said, no, I'm pissed off because everything you said today was true. Mm-hmm. You take me to win the gold medals at the Sydney Olympics. And so for the next two and a half years, I worked at the women's. Australian Olympic beach volleyball team. And we beat the best team in the world, the Brazilians and came home with the gold medals. Wow. So how did you go from being actor um, and, you know, producing events, public speaker to being like an international success coach? You know, the funny Lori is, you know, I, I wondered that myself, actually, you know, (laughs) okay. um, The funny part is I've kind of always done it. Uh, When I, when I quit Hollywood, I went to one of my high school reunions and P 
people said, you know, I thought they'd be shocked because I was an actress since I was 12 years old. I lied about mm -hmm. my age and got on stage in Chicago at Second City. And um, I thought you're from Chicago, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, that's I actually uh, lived in Chicago for 27 years. My uh, older son still uh, still lives there. I, I think I read that in your book. I was like, oh, he's from Chicago. Yeah, I started acting at Second City with uh, uh, George Went from Cheers and Jim Belushi. And OK, uh -huh. Rinky, you know, they were on stage there when I was at Second City. And so I um, they said, Keurig, the funny thing is what you do now is what you've always done. You've done it in high school. You used to have little seminars in the hallway about following your goals and your dreams and you know you're always very helpful with people with that and then i realized Lori, that the reason i became an actor is i thought if i got famous somebody would want to hear me speak mm, okay but when you when you play bad guys nobody really wants to hear your story <laughs> and That's so true. <laughs> um, i got kind of got typecast and so i realized i was doing this roundabout way to get to my goal instead of just going straight for my goal and so mm -hmm. once i let go of the movie industry my career went through the roof it was like a slingshot it's been a rocket ride actually yeah isn't that funny how sometimes when you let go of something that is not meant for you or is maybe it's just a door that needs to be closed and you truly let it go like that new opportunity that's more aligned with who you are just like takes off. Yes. We, we have to ask ourselves consistently, by the way, I mean, not every day yet consistently is what am I, you know, going to give and give up to have everything I want. Mm -hmm. See, because you have to give something, you have to plant seeds to get the crop, to get the harvest, but also sure. you have to make room for it. You know, we only mm -hmm. have so much space. Otherwise you have to maintenance all this stuff that you're doing because otherwise it's going to die in the vine anyways. So it'd be better just to let it go. By the way, I can always go back to Hollywood. The funny thing is I, I just got offered to be in another movie. Oh, did uh, you? you know, we're getting ready to produce my own TV show. And, oh, uh, fun. You know, right, with the producer who did I, Robot with Will Smith. Um, you know, so it, the funny thing is Hollywood, all that stuff that we have never gets wasted. You use it somewhere sure. else. Yes. It's just that I had to let go of it because I had a real dual focus. Mm -hmm. But also it's because I, I help people and, you know, live their dreams and produce crazy results. And then over here, I'm playing bad guys in the movies and scaring the daylights out of people. It was really um, confrontational for people. And somebody asked me once, how can you do that when this is what you teach? And then as soon as I started to say something, they said, don't you say that's justification? That's a blow the line thing. And I'm like, oh, man, checkmate. On my own, <laughs> right? and so I said, "You're right," and so that's when I that day I just let go of the movie industry, and luckily, mm -hmm. both sides of the camera, both movies that I worked on, um, won awards. Mm -hmm. It was a great way to end, you know, end where you still love it. Yes, end while you're you're high, right? Yep. Like yeah, end, yeah. It, it, don't let it take the turn. Yeah, that's something my uh, spouse and I uh, have talked about in the past. Like uh, some of these professional athletes that are you know, they're at their high and, you know, they're at their best. And like, now is the time for you to retire and, and go, but they continue to push it. And then they just kind of like start, you know, going downhill. And it's like, ah, why didn't you exit when you were, you were at your peak when you were the goat. <laughs> yeah. And reinvent yourself then, you know, I mean, you look, uh -huh. at, I, I mean, I've known Sly since I was 18 and, you know, Sly's the biggest movie star Hollywood's ever produced. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's, uh, almost 80 years old now. He's 78 this year. Wow. He's still a viable action hero. He's got a hit mm -hmm. TV show called the Tulsa King. He's got his reality show with his family. Um, you know, when you are, spend time with Sly, he still looks like a movie star. Mm -hmm. He still looks, he still looks like an apex, uh, masculine male, you know, like in the room, mm -hmm. he's King right. Dog you know, at 78 years old, but he's not trying to be the 30 year old version sure. of, mm -hmm. of Rocky, you know, he's, he's the today version and it's, it's yeah. awesome because of his reinvention. I like that because it's like with each, um, I'm actually working on in, an article for um, a magazine and it's about self-evolution 
and I've been kind of walking through like my own life from, you know, my early twenties to, you know, today and each, you know, evolution brings us into a different place within ourselves. And if we can embrace like who we are today and what does today's version of ourselves look like and not stay stuck in, well, once upon a time, I was so young and I was so much thinner and I was so much this, you know, it, uh, it, it doesn't serve us. Right. No. And you hear people, you know, their claim to fame is like, I was the prom king or queen in high school. Uh huh. That's like 40 years ago. Right. <laughs> yeah. What have yeah. you done lately? And it's, it's, you know, we have to keep reinventing ourselves. It's a road that's always under construction, you know, and mm -hmm. what's the next evolution? Mm -hmm. You know, I spent five years on the road in the early 90s with Anthony Robbins. You know, Tony had like 400 Love him. in those days, mm -hmm. you know, and our goal was to get him up to a thousand people, which we did way past that, obviously. Right, right. Um, but Tony, you know, still does. Well, he, he just made an announcement here in Sydney that he's not coming back because he's got health issues. Oh, um, but how old is you know, he now? Tony, Tony and I are the same age. So he's 60. Tony might be 63 because he's born in leap year. Okay. But we're, we're around the same age. He's okay. Yeah. I want to say I saw him. Mm, I bet it's been at least 15 years, probably. Yeah. But he did it, the same program since the eighties. Right. Me, I, I can't do that. That's why I didn't, I did some theater I just got bored with it because doing the same scene, same play, same spot, mm -hmm. same dialogue every day is to me is like a factory. So even with my workshops, my public programs, I keep reinventing them. I keep retiring them and then bring a new one out because it's the next evolution of me. If you read Wayne Dyer's books since your erroneous zones, mm -hmm. you know, to the end of his Love career, him too. each book was his evolution of his own life. Now each mm -hmm. book had value for people at that level. You know, mm -hmm. like people can read your erroneous zones, but he didn't really teach that anymore. He was teaching his new evolutions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Which I loved. And I was, I knew Wayne really well and he was a great mentor and, and held me up one day at one of his own programs talking to me about, you know, cause I was really starting my speaking career. And he said, uh, where, how is it that you're the guy who teaches spirituality, but you say, I'm not the money guy. Okay. I said, I said yeah. And he said, where'd you learn that crap? He said, by mm -hmm. the way, money's not the root of evil. Poverty is. Mm -hmm. Poverty causes mm -hmm. problems, not, not wealth. Right. And he said, uh, you know, when, mo when you have money, by the way, you can do whatever you want to do with it, including help people. Sure. You, know, you got mm -hmm. to stop, stop teaching this crap. And I said, sir, I, I think they're announcing you on stage right now. And he just looked at me and he goes, what are they going to do? Start without me? <laughs> I'm start with you right now. And I said, yes, sir. I, and then I bumped into him. Um, here in Brisbane years later. And he goes, obviously you got over that money hang up. Sure. Mm. I said, yes, sir. And he said, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I live here now. And he's like, man, you're everywhere. <laughs> so, um, how did this book come to be? Yeah. The title wrote it. Um, I was doing a coaching session mm -hmm. and I, I, cause I use references from every different angle to loosen people's minds up so that you see right. everything saying the same thing, spiritual, motivational, inspirational, science, you know, quotes, whatever that is, so that you go, wow, you know, from all these different sources. And I was talking about that in Mary Magdalene's scriptures that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, she doesn't refer to Jesus as the Messiah. She calls him the love. The Bible mm -hmm. says, if you do not lo know love, you do not know God because God is love. By the way, I'm not religious. My mom was Jewish. My dad was Christian. I was just really confused. Um, <laughs> okay. They, um, you know, so love is the most powerful force in the universe. Well, your identity is the most powerful thought you can have. It's who you say mm -hmm. you are. Well, imagine if you identified yourself as love, how would you respond to everything differently in life? Mm -hmm. Would you allow yourself to be abused? Would you allow yourself to be poor? Would you allow right. yourself to smoke cigarettes? Well, love doesn't respond that way. So sure. Uh, I was working with uh, an audience in Melbourne down in uh, Victoria here in Australia. And a woman said she was in a relationship with a man for married 25 years. He was abusive mm -hmm. and she's now out. And I said, I asked her, I said, ma'am, 
I'm just curious. Did you ever date the man or did you just marry him? Mm-hmm. And she said, no, I dated him. I said, was he abusive then? She said, yeah. And you still dated him? And she said, yeah. And I said, um, did you get engaged? And she said, yeah. Was he still abusive? And she said, yep. And I said, and you had three kids with him after getting married? She said, yep. She said, are you blaming me? And I said, no, ma'am. What I'm showing you is that your own self-love finally evolved because that's when you walk away because love doesn't tolerate. Mm-hmm. Right. And so like, she was like, wow, you know, that, that I, this wasn't going where I was going, but you got to take responsibility that you stood in there for 25 years. Right. We can't keep. Yes, absolutely. We, we know, all have choices and, and, and we make those choices based on that version of ourselves in each and every moment of our lives. So that version of her lasted 25 years, that version of her that sure. believed that she did not deserve love, um, starting with love for herself, right? Yeah, and that's a self-love thing. So every issue that we deal with as human beings, it's a self-love issue. Because mm-hmm. when you really love yourself, you know, you you go, wait a minute, I'm like even stressing out over paying your mortgage or what you're getting paid at work or whatever, you know, when you really love yourself, well, love would go find a job that pays better or get a, get an education to get you the better job or whatever, you know, you start investing in yourself. There's that reinvention again, you know, that you go, mm-hmm. wait a minute, um, I'm watching an industry dry up and I'm just waiting for my head to get chopped off here. I'm going to start investing now and retraining for something else. Or I'm going to jump ship before the sink goes, the ship goes down. But people, you know, they don't. I mean, you, (laughs) I I, I laugh here. You go by their hospitals and you see people sitting outside, literally with their drip bottle on a stand with their open back gown, smoking cigarettes. I, yeah, I know. (laughs) And there's a group of them and they're all chatting with each other. Right, right. Well, that's not very loving. Right. Love would not respond that way. No. And so the book is, you know, and and I'm in awe, Lori, that I'm the guy who got to write that book, even though I think it kind of came more through me than from me. Mm -hmm. And um, I I just got an email today from somebody who said how profound that book has changed your life. I get that every day from around the world, um, from different countries, Facebook posts, you know, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people keep it keep it by their bedside and they open up a page every day and it always seems to be the right page that they turn to. It's one of those type books and I'm I'm in awe that mm-hmm. I could be that guy that wrote that book or I'm on a plane and somebody goes, oh my God, you're Kirk Ashley. And I'm like, whoa. I already, I already Who are you? That. How do you yeah. know me? <laughs> well, calm down. Thank you. And I love your book. Okay. Okay. I get it. But it's, um, it, it never gets old. That's a good feeling. It's a good feeling knowing that you are creating positive change in the world, that you're making an impact on humanity. To me, that's no better feeling, right? Best job in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So you talked about in the beginning about you don't really like give content or give like tips or whatever. What you do is you create transformation. Yes. Let's talk about, yeah, like let's talk about the transformation because, you know, I'm, you know, working with um, basically mission driven individuals and organizations that are out there to create positive change for humanity. And I don't care who you are. When you are running a business, you are always going to be up against yourself. Right. And oftentimes, you know, yes, there's a million external obstacles out there that we have to battle all the time, but there's probably just as many internal uh, obstacles, in my opinion. Like, (laughs) I feel like entrepreneurship is just as challenging as parenting was (laughs) for me. Um, So let's talk about just from a success standpoint, like, what are the transformations that you are helping people create in their lives um, when you work with them? And maybe what are the strategies that you, that you use to help that success come alive? Sure. Well, I, uh, two years ago, I helped a gentleman cure himself of Tourette syndrome. 
I felt wow. a woman harmonize herself from a schizophrenic with seven diagnosed personalities into one harmonized human being. And 20 years later, she's still that person. Uh, people cure themselves of cancer. People have been numerous parents who've been told it's impossible to have kids. I'll have children now. Um, taking numerous people around the world to number one in network marketing companies, different com different businesses, um, mom and pop businesses to $10 million in profit a year, like crazy results. Um, every sports team, every athlete I've worked with have all won Olympic gold medals, football teams, rowers, swimmers, golfers, doesn't, I don't need to know the sport. Right. Um, and so, you know, transformation, if you look at the word A-T-I-O-N means the experience of. So whenever you see that at the end of a word, it means the experience of. Trans means to go beyond. Form is mm -hmm. what we have now. So it's the experience to go beyond what we have right now. Hmm. And okay. So, so to... I, I don't have any judgment. My question is always, how can we make this better? Mm -hmm. You know, and the first thing is that there's a formula or that um, I've just kind of broken down. What is it? The difference between a successful person and an average person? Mm -hmm. Well, we all go through the same stuff. Everybody, right. does. everybody went through COVID, you know, everybody went mm -hmm. through, you know, the global financial crisis, you know, by the mm -hmm. way, in 2008, it was so cool. We had to give it an acronym, the GFC, you know, <laughs> More right. people have died from KFC than GFC, but people freaked out for the <laughs> market of the GFC. Right. So the, the key distinction is that successful people, number one, we learn how to manage how we think and feel differently. Mm -hmm. Because when you think and feel differently, you're going to create differently. Right. So during the global financial crisis, people were freaking out and selling their homes and you know, trying to get out from under a mortgage and whatever. And successful people were buying them because they were cheaper that week. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So we, we're all going through the same stuff. But so the first thing we have to do is what we talked about earlier is you got to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't be who you were. And, and Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that would survive, nor the most intelligent. It's the ones who are most able to adapt. Adapt. Right. So we got to evolve right. or you mm -hmm. dissolve. You either grow or you decay. So because the law of polarity says, if you're not going in one direction, by default, you're going in the other. True. Mm -hmm. and, and so to work on that. So the first thing I always do, no matter what, it's an athlete, it's a business leader. It's I've worked with Apple and Seagate and some of the biggest country, companies in the world. I always start with the personal development mm -hmm. because you are your business. And one of the things, Lori, as you, you touched on already is people don't tell you as an entrepreneur, it's a lonely ride first. You know, right. you're sitting in front of the computer and you're pounding out the keys and you're doing this stuff. And there's nobody to share with. And even when you do share it with people, they're like, yeah, yeah, good for you. Good for you. And they just don't get what you put into it. Right. Also, right. There's a dark side to success. You know, as you start going from struggling to successful, a lot of the people that you thought your friends and family who cared about you all of a sudden are pissed off that you're not a, vac a victim anymore. Sure. Mm hmm. And or that you're not. successful and there's you're successful in there and they're not, or yeah. you're not the same version of yourself that they're used to. And now they have to get used to a, a new version of you. But they don't want to, they'd rather right. they like you better when you're a victim. Cause at least they felt better about their own lives. Sure. Mm -hmm. So the guy with the Tourette syndrome, I warned him and sure. <laughs> he said, no, Kirk, I'm really close to my family. And then he called me up and said, man, my cousin. So I was so close to all of a sudden want to have anything to do with me because I don't have Tourette's anymore. Wow. That's crazy. I, said, I warned you. I told you it's mm -hmm. the dark side. So right. the, the, the thing that I work with, again, it comes down to formula because I want what I teach to work for everybody, not somebody, um, not lucky people, mm -hmm. not special people, not people with a special Zodiac sign that nobody else has or a special chromosome, you know, that it works for everybody. It's because it's based in physics and science. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you think about the scientific formula of that, if you have the right mindset and you develop some new skill sets and mm -hmm. you follow through on that, what can't you produce? What can't you have? You can pretty much have everything. Mm -hmm. And the way we're going to do that is through education, application of the education, and then follow through. And people say, well, why does follow through come twice? Well, because the fortune's always in the follow through because most people quit just before they were about to succeed, you know? So it's that you gotta, if you follow through, I wrote two other books before how would love respond and never finished them. 
because mm. I was babbling on paper. I didn't know how to structure my thoughts in those days. Mm-hmm. And nobody's ever read those books, even though I spent months and months and months on each of them, but never finished them. How right. would love respond? I wrote every day for four years until finally you put, it doesn't really say the end, but you get it, you know, mm-hmm. and then it gets published and then you learn the marketing to get it sold. Now right. you have a best-selling book. And that, again, people, they're, they're writing a book, they print up the book and they have never learned the marketing or the drive of it. And now they're trying to do it once their book's sitting there getting old and losing right. enthusiasm and inspiration. And me, I studied all that stuff in the four years of writing the book. So that mm-hmm. the moment my book came out, it took number one on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. I had 15 bestsellers lists in four hours of release. It was a number one. And then right. 30 days later, I had another 10 bestsellers list. But that's just doing, you know, having the right mindset of going, okay, I got to learn this. What skill sets do I need to learn? Let's do it. Let's apply mm-hmm. it. It sounds simple. And, and you and I both know that it's not always simple right? There's internal obstacles that we come up against. Like, what would you say are like the most common like obstacles that people are facing that get in the way of them mastering these concepts? Well, a couple of things, Lori, and that is number one is they don't fill their tank up at the beginning of the day when they first get up, you know, they, okay. they jump right into work instead of work on yourself first. Mm-hmm. You are your business. So I get up, I meditate, I exercise, I, I get up at four in, in the morning every day because every extra hour you're awake is an extra 40 and a half hours a week, 40 hour weeks that you have every year, uh, nine and a half, 40 hour weeks you have every year to live your life. We imagine if you applied those nine and a half, 40 hour weeks towards your development, what you'd have, right? right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I read my morning questions, my goals, my affirmations, things like that. I tune myself up first. Okay. Because now you have that fortitude, that strength to cut through what happens in life. Also is ask for help. Um, Mm. I was on stage here with Arnold Schwarzenegger in Sydney. You know, I was the keynote that opened for him. Well, I sent marketing materials back a couple months out before it happened. And Stallone sends me a message and come have, have lunch with me in Beverly Hills. So I shoot back. He has Arnold Schwarzenegger joining me for lunch just so I can meet him. And Arnold said to me at the table, really nice man, unbelievably wonderful. I watched his, uh, I watched his uh, documentary uh, series. That was, it was pretty good. I liked it. What a man so present with you that it actually puts you off that he's more concerned about, you know, what you do and interested in you than telling you about himself. Really amazing Mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. And so he said to me, he said, look, Kirk, most people think I'm a self-made man and there's nothing farther from the truth. He said, I've had help every step of the way. And he said, only poor people don't get any help because they don't ask for it. They try Mm. to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing is, you know, network. If you're not networking, you're not working. Connect up with other entrepreneurs, other friends of yours, you know, and tune up because when you face, talk to each other and you're, that you're facing the same problems. It's not Mm -hmm. so bad, you know, and when you talk to each other and you, you network and network, by the way, isn't going to a breakfast where you eat greasy breakfast. You sit at a table with your own friends and you leave some cards on the table. That's not networking. Networking is the building and nurturing of relationships. And mm-hmm. that's business. Right. And so we have to do that consistently. So it's so easy to get our nose down to the grindstone, grinding out every day and forget that we should get ourselves out there and tune ourselves up, mm-hmm. take breaks during the day and take some nature walks. And people go, man, I, I don't have the time. You don't have time not to. Because, you, you know, it's like saying, I'm so busy flying my plane, I don't have time to put fuel in it. Right. Oh, I'm so guilty of that. Like, I have the hardest time. Like, uh, just once I start working, I'm just like in a in a zone. And it's like, I've been really forcing myself to just take a break. Like, okay, it's lunchtime. Go downstairs and eat your yogurt and your protein bar. And I'm like on the edge of my seat. Like, okay let me just eat this really fast so I can get back upstairs. And I don't know what it is energetically about me, but I do have a really hard time like taking a battery out. Well, and also, you know, one of the things I I work with people on is, you know, set a timer on your phone to go off every hour. 
And when you do, mm -hmm. you got to take five full deep breaths and center yourself again, you know, just okay. recharge your batteries. And you're going to notice you have so much more energy during the day. You're going to have so much more accomplished. But if we stay toe to toe with our problems, the problem is going to beat the daylights out of you. So mm -hmm. we got to keep ourselves strong. We, you know, I, I, I train in a martial arts called Aikido and it's not about, mm -hmm. it's about not taking conflict head on. It's about connecting, blending and redirecting. So you become one with the energy and you redirect it to work for you instead of it working against you because it's going to do one or the other. And so it's, this, it's metaphoric for life mm -hmm. is to, to um, make sure that we take care of number one first, because why are we working so hard, Lori? What are we doing right. this for? What? So that right. we have a big bank account that somebody else gets to spend after we die, you know, <laughs> that, um, that True. we have a, a bigger house to be lonely in. Right. You know, that, you know, that we're, we got the Ferrari, but we're sick driving it. What's the point? Exactly. So the purpose of our life is to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of life. It's not any more complicated than that. Enjoy your life. At the end of your life, if you look back and you enjoyed it, you know, you won. Yes. If not, you're going to be slapping yourself in the forehead going, what was I thinking? Right. What you have like is the relationships you've created, Right the memories or the experiences that you've had in your life. Um, and that's what you're really looking at, right? Like that's what you're looking at when you, when you're on your last leg, you know, you're not like, Oh, I've got, you know, $5 million in the bank and I'm leaving this all to my kids. And I, I mean, no, and it doesn't know, matter. Like you said, it goes away. Like it's gone. <laughs> the most successful thing I've ever done is I have a 12 year old mm -hmm. son. It took me 50 mm -hmm. years to get ready to have kids. My mom was dying of cancer in Chicago. Um, she was Jewish. I called her up. She said, save your money. Don't waste it on a plane. <laughs> My mom, I'm coming home. Just don't die on me. Right. 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 <clears throat> Tribute. And I spent that last 10 days with her. Mm -hmm. And at the you know last day she was unconscious, she was passed out. And my wife and I at the time um, were holding her hand in the emergency room and she opened her eyes and she said, have babies. Have like, babies. Now, mom, you got nothing. And she goes, your five brothers and your sister all have kids. But man, I've always wanted to meet yours because since you were a baby, you've had a different energy, you know, just who mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, mom, you know what? This time in the hospital actually made me ready. I had this conversation with myself this week. I said, um, but you got to stay around to see him. She's like, don't piss me off. Just have him. I go, all right, mom, calm down. I love you. Mm -hmm. I, will, I promise. And she said, now I want you to leave. I don't want you here. Mm. And my mom timed it. And I was on my way back to LA to go to Australia. And my mom died in her sleep. That was her last mm -hmm. conversation. And two Aww. weeks later, got my wife pregnant. And that's my son. Aww. But that's. Your, your kids spell love, T-I-M-E. They want your time. Mm -hmm. And so I've rearranged my business and my life so I'm not on the road so much and mm -hmm. still making the money and still being successful, but spending time with my son. And I've spent more time in my son's 12 years than I spent with my dad my whole life because mm. he was so busy following a formula that said, if you want to succeed in life, you got to work hard. Right. And my dad right. worked hard his whole life. And the only thing he got out of it was a hard life. Yeah. Because hard doesn't produce easy. That's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. It's learning how to live the lifestyle now because your brain picks up, I love this, and it's going to expand on it and want more of it right. automatically. So, you know, that I, I I just operate differently. I don't have a 14-acre farm on the Sunshine Coast so I can drive up my driveway and, and say I have a farm. Instead, I love enjoying it and walking around and I have bees and I produce my own honey and, you know, mm -hmm. and people ask me who who does all your fields and stuff i go that would be me mm, mm -hmm. because i love it right that's cool so i have one just little question because uh it was such a profound experience for me and, and it's something that you and i have in common and that is doing the firework um mm. i did you know as you can probably imagine i did the firework at a tony robbins event um, is that where you first did it or I, well, I, yes, it's when I, I, cause I spent five years with Tony. So I did the fire walk uh, like 50, 60, 80 times with him. Easy. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and I started teaching the fire walk myself uh, anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and I also take people across broken glass and we do all kinds of different, it makes the fire walk look tame. When you take people across broken glass, we had 850 people in Singapore going across 15 lanes of broken glass and that oh. one person cut. Um, the fire walk for me is, it's a great metaphor. We are fire, Lori. You know I mean? If you think about it, we're energy, we're a spark, mm -hmm. we're, you mm -hmm. know, we, we, we generate power. So the mantra when I walk across the fire and I take people across is called one with the source. Mm -hmm. is that you're saying I'm one with the fire. I'm one with the universe. Universe fire can't mm -hmm. burn fire, and that's mm. why you know in in the tens of thousands of people I've taken fire walking, I've, we've never had a burn. We've never had anybody injured because we play the game at a really high level. Mm -hmm. My mom, I, I I called my mom. My mom was a really serious drunk. My mom could drink a half a gallon of scotch or vodka in a night. Mm. And then I watched her knock two police officers out once. My mom had a real violent streak about her, you know? Okay. And so I said, mom, I'm coming back to Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a program. I'd love to have you see it. Mm -hmm. got like 2000 people coming. Um, I want to warn you, there's a fire walk involved. Now you don't have to do it and you will, but alcohol comes out of your pores when you sweat and it's flammable. And it right. happened to another woman where her leg started on fire and she caused us $200,000 insurance claims. And so, mom, you know, you being the drunk you are, your body's going to burst into spontaneous combustion. Your wig's going to start on fire. And when you fall over writhing <laughs> pain, these people are so motivated, they're going to fire walk right over the top of you. <laughs> Lori, it was, just a, it was just a story I made up for my mom. It never happened. <laughs> but my mom believed me. See, the okay. acting me came out. And <laughs> my mom didn't have a drink for like a week leading up to the fire walk. Okay. She never shows up on my lane. I don't know where she is. Right. Well, we're all heading back into the seminar room. Uh -huh. A staff member taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, Kirk, isn't that your mom over there in the parking lot standing by herself? Right. I'm like, oh, my God, something happened. You know, so I walk over to her. I say, mom, you OK? And she goes, your mom is a firewalker. Like, all right. You need to calm down. <laughs> my mom said, if I could do this, what I thought was impossible, giving up alcohol is easy. And my mom became clean and sober on the spot. And was clean and sober for the next 18 years until she passed away. Wow. Wow. What an amazing story. Like, it was very, like, mind-blowing for me. I would say the firewalk was mind-blowing for me in terms of understanding the power of the mind. And the other thing that was mind-blowing for me was when I got my black belt in Taekwondo. And I had to break a kind of a big lake brick, you know, it was kind of probably this thick and wide. And, you know, I watched everyone go up and like break it. And it was like, oh, that looks easy. That looks simple, you know? And when I went up to do it, I was the smallest one in my whole group. And when I went up to do it, like I literally like hit brick and I was just like, okay, this is not easy. Like, this is not easy at all. This actually hurt. And my grandmaster, I remember he got kind of frustrated with me because I was taking several times. He's like, go sit down, go sit down, go sit down. I'm just like, okay, fine. I came back up, uh, you know, at the very end and he said, uh, okay, listen to me, listen to me. He said, pretend that that brick is not there and just break it. And I'm like, Okay. And I literally shifted in my mind. And I, when I came up and came down on the brick, I literally just pretended like it's not there. And I can't even tell you, it felt like I was like breaking through a piece of paper. Yeah. Congratulations. I was just like, wow, mind blowing how powerful the mind is. <laughs> yeah. And so I did 266 feet of 1200 recalls. So I quadrupled the world record. Wow. It was, on, it was on CNN and um, it was 1998. Um, there was a gentleman who tried to break my record here in Sydney a mm. couple years later and wound up making like um, about 20 feet. And they almost had to amputate his feet that night because 20 feet falling. out of 220. Well, I think I, I think Tony yeah. Robbins is only what, about six to eight feet or something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So but he, feet. he got really badly burned. Maybe he got a little farther than that, but it wasn't far because when you're, 
losing your focus because the TV cameras are telling you when to go and what to do mm -hmm. and the rest of the stuff. And he wasn't focused. And I saw even before he started, I said, man, this guy's in deep trouble. And sure enough, he hurt himself really bad. Um, luckily, he recovered. But uh, it's one of those things that it's real fire. And that's, you know, like there's no mm -hmm. magic trick and it's real glass. Right. It's, you know, there's no faking it. And if you go on YouTube, you'll see me on TV shows taking people across broken glass and, you know, hosts and stuff. And um, it's real. It's the real thing. But mm -hmm. if you watch the host, you'll see the change in their face. Like once they get off, it doesn't matter if they're a TV personality. But what people don't understand is I always tell the station before I'm on a show, I need time to work with those people so that this has a meaning to them. So it's not just a stunt. If it's just a stunt, mm -hmm. somebody's going to get hurt. But mm -hmm. if they really put their intention behind it and the meaning behind it, man, you want some great camera footage. Watch that reaction when they finish. And so I just took uh, Gian Rooney, a gold uh, Olympic swimmer uh, mm -hmm. for a TV show, Firewalking. And man, she broke into tears afterwards oh. and right on camera saying, this is the most powerful thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah, it is because you realize it's just such a profound lesson in just realizing how much control, like, like the mind, like how powerful the mind is. And if you can just remember that every single day and exactly. practice that and use that concept of just how powerful your mind is, you can be unstoppable, like you said. And it gives you that reference, Lori. That's exactly what I teach people in the program is now the firewalk is don't put it on your jo job resume. You probably won't get the job. It looks like you're a freak. But <laughs> it's a great reference. So to always remind yourself daily, man, if I can do that, mm -hmm. I can do this next thing. Because mm -hmm. I was scared there. I took the first step. I followed through with the follow steps. There's that formula again. And I made it. So then maybe this process, start my own business or succeeding, take the first step, follow through with each step, you know, walk mm -hmm. with certainty. Boom, you're done. And all of a sudden, you're that person. Right. So this has been a great, great, great conversation. Um, I always like to end, you know, talking about mojo, that super power, that super magical superpower that you have in the world. Like, what is your mojo? And how do you, like, maintain it on a regular basis? My jo mojo is really clear to me. It's I love people. I've always mm -hmm. loved people. It's what drives me. You know, I money doesn't inspire me. It never has. That's why I make it because I don't chase it. Um, okay. People. I love watching people. The lights come back on. I love their inner child coming back alive where they're all of a sudden, you know, the, the blinders have been ripped off and they can see again. It's like right. a, a chicken when it's popping through the egg, thinking that inside the egg was the entire world. And mm -hmm. then your head pops out and you're going, oh my goodness. You know, right. Like, like, like brand new and they're so look excited. At, well, look what's out here. So that's what drives me. And I, I remind myself and luckily, you know, I've been doing this so long that I get reminders regularly. You know, people post stuff on Facebook or com contact, contact me or, you know, something that happens at how I've helped them, how they're in a different place, mm -hmm. um, how they still use the tools all these years later, all those things. So I have all those things watching my son, you know, he's fire walked mm -hmm. with me. He's when he was eight years old, he came to, did a full program with me and fire walked and I, love and it. I still see him using the tools. Mm -hmm. And so that's what keeps driving me. And, and then it also keeps me working on myself because well, you can't be a coach if you're not getting coached. It mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. If you can't right. teach personal development, if you're not getting personally developed, right. because otherwise mm -hmm. you're a fraud. And so I'm always working on myself which drives me to fulfill my purpose to create global abundance through love and empowerment to really, because, you know, if you look at what's going on in the world right now, Lori, if, you know, it's a battle really between good and evil going on it, you know, they've mm. separated us. You right. Know? Yeah. And when I say they, it could be conspiracy or it's a bunch of individuals, but the result is still the same. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so we can give in and say, Oh my God, the world's going to hell in a handbasket and I'm, I got to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Or we can turn it around. But guess what? Somebody had to be the Martin Luther King. Somebody had to be the Gandhi. Somebody had to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, they probably didn't want the job either. And if you watch the documentary on Martin Luther King, that man was having severe anxiety attacks the whole time mm. because they 
threatening his family and his kids and his life and right. what that man went through in that last speaking engagement in Memphis. He couldn't even show up because he was so under the weather from anxiety. Right. He was really going through bad anxiety attacks. He tells the promoters, I can't make it tonight. He winds up not showing up. They announced Mr. King won't be here today. Mm -hmm. He comes in the back door and says, I got to do what I got to do because if I don't do it, nobody is. Right. That whole time you see him looking in the audience. Is he giving, he's looking for a gunman. He's mm -hmm. already been warned what's right. going to happen. And he says, just so you understand, I've already created the movement and it's already underway and you can't stop me anymore. Mm -hmm. And the next day they shot him dead. But guess what? His movement's still going. Right. Exactly. Yep. And so, you know, but he was a man. He was a person. Gandhi was a lawyer, probably the worst person in the world to represent spirituality and, and transformational <laughs> change. But he realized I have to reinvent myself. Right. So not that I'm comparing myself up against Martin Luther King or Gandhi. I'm taking my own responsibility to stand in my position of influence and communication mm -hmm. to make positive change on the planet because I have a, a 12 year old son that I can't leave him on a planet the way it's going. Right. So I'm going to change it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And hopefully be a model for him to possibly step in and continue that change. Well, he's the Neo. I'm just the Morpheus because of my haircut. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Kirik, for uh, being on the show. I have totally enjoyed our conversation and I Hope to see you out there in the big, big uh, internet world. Thank you, Will. And thank you. And anytime you want me back, Lori, I'd be honored. What an amazing show you got. So Okay. And thank you. Send, I'll send it out to everybody I know as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lori. That's a wrap on today's episode. Thank you for tuning in to the On a Mission Mojo podcast. Ready to dive into more incredible stories of people on a mission? Next week, I'll return with a fresh episode to ignite your passion for creating a better world. If you loved what you heard, be sure to subscribe, leave a glowing review, and spread the word to all your friends. Head over to onamissionbrands.com for more great episodes. Remember, the world needs your mojo, so go out there and let your brilliance shine.